So welcome to all distinguished guests and participants of uh, today's program. Today's lecture is organized by Okamawalevi Memorial and Research Center as part of the uh, 75th year of Indian independence. Uh, we partner with uh, other centers and institutions uh, committed to the cause of democracy, human rights, and chemical harmony. Today, the Center for uh, Study of Society and Secularism, Mumbai, is associating with us in organizing this uh, distinguished lecture. Uh, we are grateful to uh, CSSS and its team for jointly organizing this program. Uh, uh, the distinguished lecture today is held on the theme, Challenges to Indian Democracy, uh, which is a, a very important subject of discussion. This is held at a time when uh, uh, instances of uh, disrespect and dishonor to the values cherished by the Indian constitution are on the increase. And by and large, these uh, values we understand within the construct of democracy, secularism and freedom of expression. Uh, but we know that the freedom of expression cannot be misused to undermine the other core values of the constitution. And it is these values that have come under frequent attacks and threats from different corners. And the observance of the 75th year of independence is in fact uh, a reminder to us that uh, we can no longer ignore attempts to undermine the cherished values of freedom and dignity enshrined in the constitution. And we have hardly any alternative to democracy and secularism in the years beyond the 75th year of independence. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us today Professor uh, Ram Kuniani, an accomplished scholar and a fearless social critic whose uh, interventions and writings uh, continue to inspire all. Uh, as you all know, he served as a professor of uh, biomedical engineering at uh, IIT Mumbai uh, for almost uh, three decades and devoted his entire life to the cause of uh, human rights, secular values, and fighting against communalism and all authoritarian tendencies. In fact, he had a already, trans I mean, by being a professor in IIT, he had transcended his disciplinary boundaries and saw the world as, uh, as an important domain of his activities. And he has been part of uh, several people's commissions uh, for the dispensation of justice and liberty. Uh, Professor uh, Ram uh, has also been a prolific writer and orator. There are uh, more than a dozen books and hundreds of articles to his credit. And uh, he is also, I must say, the president of the, the Center for the Study of so Society and Secularism in Mumbai. Thank you, Professor Ram, for being with us today and welcome you on all behalf of uh, BMRC and uh, CSSS. Pleasure is mine. Thank you. Uh, chair of this uh, meeting today is uh, Advocate uh, Irfan Engineer, who needs no introduction to this audience. In fact, he is on the board of patron patrons of uh, VMMRC, and he had delivered the first uh, VMMRC memorial uh, lecture in 2020. Irfan is uh, currently director of uh, uh, CSSS and editor of the Indian Journal of Secularism, a very active and intervention interventionist scholar critic, uh, and he keeps writing on critical issues of democracy and secularism. And we all receive uh, his writings and uh, his uh, speeches through CSS's uh, website, as well as uh, the writings through the secular perspective that we get, as well as uh, from the writings of, uh, uh, from the writings of the Indian Journal of Secularism, which has been uh, one of the pioneers uh, in, uh, in the history of uh, the Indian independence and democracy. And I welcome, uh, Sri Irfan on behalf of uh, PMMRC and all those who have come together today to listen to the distinguished lecture by uh, Professor Ram Kuniani. We have uh, audience and guests from different parts of the world, from different time zones. We cannot just say good morning, good afternoon, <laughs> good evening because uh, they, they, they come from different zones. 
from the United States, from Canada, from Dubai, from Europe, Italy. Uh, we have friends uh, from India, very eminent persons uh, from uh, different uh, uh, parts of this country, like uh, Professor Hargobal, uh, Professor. Uh, 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 I can see a lot. Uh, I don't want to name the whole uh, lot of people. I, I respect uh, uh, their presence and also their participation in this program. So on behalf of all, I welcome all distinguished guests and participants of this program, and I request uh, uh, Irfan Engineer to conduct the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Professor Sidi, for putting me in chair. <clears throat> it is very difficult to chair a distinguished lecture, which is uh, going to be delivered by Ram Punyani, a very eminent, and as you rightly introduced him uh, as a very eminent person, humble person, and uh, passionate activist as well, working for peace. Today's topic is indeed very, very important, interesting, crucial for this country, for the life of uh, nations. Uh, now, there are two kinds of democracies. Which democracy we are talking about? Mm -hmm. Professor Ram Punyani will throw, uh, throw more light on this. One is uh, just called as formal democracy or representative democracy. And the other is substantial democracy. Representative democracy means just a procedure to elect the ruler. And then the citizen becomes almost powerless and has no role to play. That is what every ruler, particularly authoritarian rulers, want. But once they get elected, they try to control everything. Democracy, uh, representative democracy means an institutional arrangement in which there are checks and balances, in which there is accountability to governance where citizens have fundamental rights, right to dissent, freedom of expression, freedom to follow any religion, freedom of religion or belief. No religion is discriminated. No citizen is discriminated on basis of religion or caste or patriarchy, gender or region. And uh, our constitution envisions this uh, substantial democracy. And the laws that are enacted over 70 years take baby step. Of course, we have a lot more to achieve, a lot more accountability we need from the uh, government. But uh, this puts us into mere uh, voters, the, uh, uh, the representative democracy wants us to be mere voters, vote, elect, and then become bhats, sort of followers. Uh, it reminds us of medieval subjects, where medieval rulers treated their subjects as people who do not have any rights, people do, uh, who do not have uh, any say in governance. But uh, representative democracy, on the other hand, now it is this represent, uh, representative uh, democracy that is under challenge, under severe challenge. And there are various severe challenges that I'm sure Professor Ram Punyani will throw more light about. Uh, we have a feudal structure. We had a feudal structure and still remnants of feudal culture that uh, does not easily accept uh, democratic structures. It, it, it wants us, it wants citizens to become subjects and tries to push us back into that uh, uh, representative democracy. We have issues of identity politics that are challenging us. We have growing inequalities, the crony capitalism, uh, where uh, uh, the rich 1% are trying to use democratic structures or structures of democracy to push citizens back into being subjects, as being workers, as laborers, as people without rights. Uh, there are many, many challenges. Uh, this evening, we are all eager to hear 
Professor Ram Punyani uh, on this subject, and I invite Professor Ram Punyani to deliver uh, this uh, in his insightful lecture, this distinguished lecture, followed by discussion that we will have, question and answers. Uh, as Professor Ram Punyani speaks towards the end, if you have any questions based on that, kindly type your questions in the chat box uh, so that we can uh, refer those questions to Professor Ram Punyani. And uh, now I invite uh, Professor Ram Punyani to deliver his distinguished <clears throat> lecture. Uh, good evening, friends. I'm particularly grateful to Professor Sithi for inviting me to this lecture and also for his uh, generous introduction about me. Uh, very much thankful to Irfan Engineer, uh, who is chairing the meeting. And uh, as a chairperson, he has already uh, put forward uh, in summary the challenges which our Indian democracy faces. Now, it is uh, too much of a common knowledge that to, as to how our democratic rights are being undermined directly and indirectly, overtly and covertly. I will not go too much into the type of things which are happening, but some things which have happened in recently, recent past, I will, uh, before coming to that, I will try to see that uh, as Irfan has correctly pointed out, democracy is not a finished product. Democracy to me is a journey in which we begin from a formal democracy and go towards substantive democracy. And how does this transition go? How does this change go? This is not a sudden process. This is a process of a deepening of the democratic culture, which is on paper to in our practice. Now, right after our independence, these challenges were recognized. And these challenges were recognized that time by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who I regard as one of the major uh, founders of uh, the great values which came out from the freedom movement. So one interesting, uh, two interesting episodes I will tell about uh, Pandit Nehru. Uh, one is that once somebody interviewed him, I think a French journalist interviewed him and asked him, uh, sir, what are your major problems? So he said that uh, I have a very secular democratic constitution, but the society is in the grip of religiosity. So Nehru even at that time <clears throat> could see the danger which politics in the name of religion can pose to democratic society. That is one. And how he himself dealt with, uh, with this journey, how he himself wanted to go towards a substantive democracy is illustrated by one very interesting, two very interesting incidents. One is that of a very great cartoonist Shankar, V. Shankar, I think he was, that was his name, uh, in the decade of 1950s and 60s. He was a towering person and uh, uh, his cartoons were looked forward by most of the people. And by default or by design or by this thing, Nehru was the most prominent person that time. And Shankar used to draw regular cartoons of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. Now, of course, Nehru noticed them. Nehru saw them. And he asked his office to uh, call Shankar. Now, when uh, Shankar was uh, received a call from PMO office, I don't know. Had it been today's time, he would have uh, panicked. But Shankar was uh, told very, uh, very lovingly that uh, can you come and share a cup of tea with the prime minister? Shankar, of course, was happy to come. And when Shankar came, Nehru discussed with him a lot of things. And he said, there is a request. You continue what you are doing. But what you do, every time you draw a cartoon, send a copy to me. Because many times I'm missing those cartoons. So you do send a copy of your cartoons to me. So this was one thing. And today, I will just show a contrast. Just in the afternoon, I was seeing a news on the TV or reading some newspaper. A chicken sailor, chicken sailor has been taken to jail. What is his crime? He wrapped the chicken in a newspaper on which the photo of Hindu God was there. So his crime is that 
he did not examine the newspaper in which he regularly wraps his chicken. So this is the state we have come. And there are so many instances. Recently, we have seen that uh, Zubair, that alt, alt uh, fact checker, doing such a brilliant job telling, shift, uh, uh, telling the distinction between fake news and the real news. He has been arrested. And for what? For a small clip, clip from a brilliant, uh, brilliant film, comedy film of 1984, Kisi Se Na Kehna. Now, of course, I don't can't resist the temptation of telling that uh, uh, nice uh, story behind that. Now, a honeymoon couple is coming, and the husband promises wife that I'll we'll go to the honeymoon hotel. And when they come there, the wife notices that the name of the hotel is changed to Hanuman Hotel. Obviously, Hanuman, uh, as we understand, and honeymoon they don't go together. So this was this was a clip which was a, a popular film a humorous film, and that he had tweeted three, four years ago for which he is in jail, he is in prison. Now, there are innumerable examples. Our uh, friend and uh, a person for whom all of us should have great admiration and the courageous human rights activist, Tisa Setalwad, fighting relentlessly for uh, victims of Gujarat riot. She has been sent to jail. And what is her crime? There is, there is a, a statement by the judge that you are pursuing this case from last 18 years. So there must be some vested interest. You are disturbing the, this thing. And based on this, Home Minister makes some comments. And then she is arrested for God knows how long it will take before she comes out and starts contributing to the democratic processes, which anyway are very feeble in the society. And I can go on and on with these type of uh, examples. Uh, sim simply speaking, today, criticizing the government is taken to be equivalent to criticizing the state. There is a clear distinction between state and the government. And state, doing anything against the state, one can understand. That can be called anti-national. But criticizing the government the way Shankar used to do, or many other people used to do, there are so many instances in Nehru's life where people frankly on his face criticized him. He took it as a smile, probably. They served as a course correction for him. Actually, in democracy, freedom of expression, criticism of government is not just meant to show your opposition. It is also meant for course correction by the rulers who can understand the sentiments of the people and uh, ideologies of the critique and try to come to a particular better policies. Now, so this was, of course, our journey which we began. And I think you all recall when four judges a few years ago came out, took a press conference and tried to point out as to how they are feeling stifled working in the intimidating atmosphere which is being created around them. From that, of course, judiciary is supposed to be independent, but last many judgments, by and large, people have a feeling that judiciary is tilt, tilt towards upholding executives' opinions goes without any doubt and it is too much noticeable. Now, the basic point of democracy is that executive Judiciary, legislative, all these wings, they balance each other. And if the executive becomes too dominant, and if judiciary takes it lying down along with other institutions, other institution, it may be enforcement directorate, it may be planning commission, of course, sorry, planning commission is no more there. It has been substituted by Niti Aayog and uh, election commission. When all these institutions which the country built with great amount of care. And the basic point was that there should be checks and balances on the executive so that we can be doing better things uh, following our path of constitution. Now, recently, of course, you must have all read that uh, a new president is going to be elected. And one of the presidential candidates pointed out very correctly that the duty of the president is to see 
that the constitution is upheld. The executive does not violate the constitution and same is the duty of judiciary. Now, so in this context where uh, executive is becoming very dominant and critics of the state, critics of this government are being labeled as anti-national. Obviously, our democracy is uh, on a great decline. And of course, we all know that in the global scale, in the global space of freedom of press, freedom of religion, these are two great markers of uh, our uh, index of freedom. India is constantly, rapidly sliding down. Actually, it is having a free fall going towards the bottom as far as freedom of religion, freedom of expression, even, even our uh, hunger, health, in all these indices, India is uh, having a semi-free fall, if not a free fall. So overall, this is why, why this is happening, why our democracy in, is in so much danger. And one of the reasons, apart from others, uh, there may be many reasons, but major reason is that in our democracy, uh, politics, which is should not have a place in any democracy, that is use of religion in politics that has increased, that has increased. And as our center has been constantly studying, monitoring communal violence, communal violence, is not just a, it is, it, is, it is killing of the innocent people, yes. Killing of the innocent people, yes. But at the same time, what we have observed that victims of the violence don't get justice, number one. And that's what the example of Kista tells us. With her bravery, she tried to get justice to so many victims of Gujarat, but again, finally, she has been jailed for that. Number two, this, communal violence, it polarizes the society along religious lines. And I understand wherever there is a polarization along religious lines, the democratic norms cannot be sustained because in democracy, our basic idea is to have the respect for all the people irrespective of their religion. The constitution, which is a guide for our uh, democracy. It has a very valuable word, and I must say, preamble of our constitution probably summarizes whole of our constitution. And even if you take first few lines of this, we, the people of India, give ourselves this uh, constitution, which gives us liberty, equality, fraternity, and social justice. So here, in the eyes of law, in the eyes of nation, we are all equal, irrespective of whatever is our religion. And that is what communal violence is doing. Gradually, there is a marginalization. There is a marginalization of Muslim minorities. And don't think that it is only the Muslim minorities who are being marginalized. There is a constant increase in anti-Christian violence also. Now, anti-Christian violence, many times it is a sub-radar, sub-radar, scattered violence, not spectacular, like Kandamal or burning of Pastor Graham Swains, but that, if we see the statistics, that violence is also going up in the degree. And that is because of the polarization, which communal violence and incidents like Kandamal and burning of pastor, Graham Stavard stains do over a period of time. So these are the things which indicate so communal violence, a gradually increasing phenomenon. And this has been achieved, this downgrading erosion of our democratic values has been done constantly by raising the issues related to religious identity. Now, if we notice that the one major issue which was raised was related to Babri Mosque. Babri Mosque was demolished. Then, uh, of course, whatever be the judgment, two important things I would like to point out about even that judgment, that how the issue was constructed. And in that, Supreme Court, despite its tilt in the judgment, it did say that 
putting of the idols in Babri Mosque in 1949 was a crime. It is not that the idols, Ramlala idols, surfaced there out of miracle or out of some divine force. Supreme Court also conceded that demolition of the Babri Mosque was a crime. It also conceded that there is no proof that Babri Mosque was made, was built after demolishing a temple and neither that Lord Ram was born precisely at that point. But these issues, they touch the raw of emotions. They touch the cord of emotions, cord of raw emotions, because of which people blinded by this are influenced. They are politically mobilized. And these are the issues which have undermined our democratic system. We know that our society has paying problems, problems which are huge, which are immense, which need immediate redressal. Problems related to poverty, hunger, disease, misery, unemployment, health issues, children's growth, etc., etc., in which country is constantly declining. But what is on our political landscape is the issue of one Babri mosque was there. Now there is the issue of Kashi Gyan Vyapi mosque. And then they are waiting for Mathura issue to be revived. This is one. Second, if you see that there was an issue of uh, beef. Many of you who are from Kerala, I must appreciate Professor Siti that he didn't wish good evening or good afternoon. So, but I, I can wish good day to all of that. And uh, the issue of beef when it came, I had been a frequent visitor to many parts of the country. And in most of the Kerala rest restaurants, I used to see the menu card with different beef items. Now, so this beef became a issue around which uh, uh, the rights of the people, because when people are charged emotionally, undermining the democratic rights becomes easier. You all know that on the issue of beef, holy cow, holy mother, there nearly 90 people were lynched. Now, this is the uh, statistics of 1914 to 1919, in which nearly 19, 90 people were, uh, 100 people were lynched, 90 Muslims and 10 Dalits. We all recall the Una incident also. Here, the truth of the matter does not matter, does not, is not important. Important is how through constant propaganda, these issues are built up. These issues are built up because I am tempted to uh, quote from Swami Vivekanan, who told us that beef was a common food item during Vedic period. Then the eminent historian, Professor D. N. Jha, in his uh, books on uh, ancient India, myth of holy cow, also supplements this point. But how this has been made an issue, and there sometimes, jocularly, I congratulate Christians that, well, you also eat beef, but you have not been targeted. It is only the Muslims who are being targeted and not all over India. Kerala, Goa and North is exempted from here. And here I feel like recounting one very interesting and humorous episode also. Now, uh, we all recall our poet Prime Minister, uh, Atal Vihari Vajpayee. I was reading one of his biographies by Vijay Trivedi. It is in Hindi called uh, Har Nahi Manunga, means this is the title of one of his poems that I will not accept defeat. So Atal Vihari Vajpayee was once on a lecture tour in America. And after lecture, which of course he used to deliver so brilliantly, after lecture, he was enjoying his food. And when he was enjoying his meals, his person sitting next to him said, Atalji, what are you doing? What you are eating is beef. Our the, the prime minister to become smiled loudly and he said, oh, it is beef. So what is the issue? It is not from Indian cow. It is from American cow. Let, you, let me enjoy my beef and you can also join in enjoying the same. Excellent. Now, so beef, then there is something called love jihad in which the image is given that uh, the Hindus are the victims. And uh, of course, incidentally, I must point out that love jihad is a uh, quote in quote 
brilliant issue devised by them. Not only on one side, it targets the Muslim youth and the Muslims as a lecturer, lecturers people who are trying to uh, woo the Hindu girls or even I think probably some of the Catholic bishops have also raised similar things, which of course uh, has no truth, but it also targets <clears throat> the Hindu girls and it is also one of the manifestations of patriarchal values where you regard that girls do not have their own mind, that they, they have to be under the control of their father, husband or son, depending on different. So these are the issues which have dominated. And this political tendency, of course, here in between, I can say that we did witness emergency. We did witness emergency. It was executive fiat in which through the top, the thing was imposed. And in 19 months, it was lifted. Now, currently what we are witnessing is that some people call it undeclared emergency. It can be also called elected autocracy. And as Irfan was pointing out, our role is that to elect the government and after that to forget for the next five years to re-elect it again because of the various machinations. Now, this politics in the name of religion, let's understand, it does not like democracy at all. It, wherever in the country, in whichever country, there is a politics where under, done under the cover of religion, it may be Pakistan, Pakistan, where it is done under the cover of Islam. It may be Sri Lanka, Myanmar, where it is done under the name, under the cover of Buddhism, or it is in India, where it is done under the cover of Hinduism. Wherever this politics comes in, it undermines the deep value, democracy, democratic values in a much deeper sense, in a much deeper sense than what an emergency can do or what executive orders can do. Because the difference here is that, difference in this type of situation is that there is a vast army of people who are indoctrinated. I can use the word brainwashed. Of course, uh, they have their own agency also, but because of various reasons, they are willing to play the role of foot soldiers and at ground they are willing, they are incited to undertake the acts which not only are anti-democratic, which not only are under uh, uh, targeting the religious minorities, but they have impunity. They enjoy impunity. Again, quoting Krista Sethalwad once more, it was probably one of the few riots, few acts of violence or carnage where her organization and other human rights groups succeeded in getting some of the guilty punished. Otherwise, otherwise, in most of the communal violence, because of the state complicity, because of the attitude of the police, for which our institute does a lot of research and other things, for all this, the culprits are knowing that they enjoy the impunity and they will not be punished for what is. So this in India, I would like to give a small background of how uh, politics in the name of religion, it ran parallel and opposite to the freedom movement. We know that we were not a democracy from eternity. Democracy is a process which comes in through uh, certain social developments, certain social changes, particularly the changes related to industrialization, transport, communication, modern education, things which connect the people, which things which give enlightenment to the people. And this is where I will like to give a concrete case of India as to in how in India, during the colonial period, we saw the roots of democracy coming up. It did not drop from the heaven. It was people's efforts that they walked on the path of democracy. And here, after the British came, uh, here again, I must uh, point out one thing. You must have heard, sometimes I'm fond of asking a question, when did we get independence? Now, I'm sure this is an elementary level question, but lately I got confused because one of the big actor has told us been actor has told us that we got independence after 2014. 
Now, so that led me to the question of what is slavery of a country and slavery of the country uh, is not due to the king ruling, a king whose religion is not the majority religion, that is not slavery. The system remains the same. Slavery of the country comes in when the wealth of the country is drained off, when the policies of the country are decided at some other place. Now, this I want to clarify. There was a medieval period, many of the Muslim kings, many of the Hindu kings ruling, but what was the common amongst them? They had a similar system of kingdom, kingdom, uh, king and the subject. That system was common to all of them. Now, in this system, what happens that British, with their own intentions come, they want to take away our wealth, they want to rule, they want to rule with the iron hand and control our resources. During this process, they bring in transport, railways, communication, telephone, telegraph, postal system, modern education, modern education, modern judiciary, and modern punitive system. So now these three systems come in. Now, along with this, there are two other major, uh, major uh, things which happen. One is the opening of education for Dalits. Dalits I'm using as a broad category without being very specific, whom we could call scheduled caste in particular, Dalits and women. So these are the five processes which lay the foundation of Indian democracy. And the tragedy of India's freedom movement is that on one side, the new processes which can lay the foundation of democracy, pluralism, diversity, democracy, and secularism come up. And on the other side, the feudal forces are not done away with. So the new classes are coming up and the old rulers, they continue though in a muted fashion. And here, if I try to explain, the roots of Indian uh, damage to Indian democracy is being done by communalism. Communalism again can be defined by various ways, but I would like to first understand how on one side we have democratic forces coming up, how on the other side the forces which believe in autocracy, which believe in that the ruler controls all, ruler makes the laws, implements the law, laws, and gives a punishment, those type of people also persisted. So from the rising groups, I will say that apart from this education for Dalits and women, there was a rise of industrialist, industrialist class, Tata Birla Bajaj Sindhani and Almiya, laying down the foundation of factories. There were workers who were working in the factories and there was a modern educated classes. Now with this, the connection of the country north, south, east, west, they went on and the feeling of Indian nationalism comes in. That's why if you see in freedom movement, people of all religions, people belonging to all religions, all regions, all languages, all different cultures and subcultures, men and women both, they participate in this process which will lead to our potential democracy. And it is from here, I will just give three examples which will make it clear as to what is their deeper political understanding. So three major examples as three icons which I give from the rising classes and the changing India are one in the form of Shahid-e Azam Bhagat Singh with Hindustan Socialist Republican Association. Second, Bhim Rao Baba Sahib Ambedkar with Republican Party of India. And third, here I'm taking four names deliberately to show that people of all religions participated in the freedom movement. Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, Annie Besant, Sardar Baldev Singh, and Mohan Das Karamchand Gandhi in the form of Indian National Congress. So these are the groups which lay the foundation of modern India, which outline the democratic processes through their movements, through their actions. And this is where we see that uh, Indian National Congress and many others, 
they lead the freedom movement bhagat singh he fights against colonial powers ambedkar lays down the laws the concept of indian democracy this i am giving representative examples this uh, thing is a sort of a capsule for understanding the freedom movement in the country now they contributed to making of india now what happens to the declining sections they also form organizations now please be alert and see the differences in the name of rising groups and differences in the names of declining groups who did not decline and here of course i must clarify in the declining sections who were the earlier rulers the organizations which were formed these organizations initially were formed by the landlords kings raja nawab zamindar jagirdar later on later on some elite educated sections some middle class sections also joined them but primarily their core remained in the values of the past they 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 looked at the past they looked at past as a golden period and here three examples are in order one is muhammad ali jinnah very complex character i will not go into details of that but he leads muslim league there is second person vinayak damodar savarkar who comes to become the chief of hindu mahasabha so please note here muslim league hindu mahasabha and hindu mahasabha ideology savarkar who lays down the uh, word hindutva as a broad hinduness covering aryan race brahminical culture and this land based on that he talks about hindu nation and it is uh, uh, rss which is formed in 1925 which takes up this agenda forward so please note friends that the roots of democracy are in the rising classes and the declining sections are coming from the feudal lords where democracy not is have is no no democracy is no no and autocracy is their way of life so this is where i think we need to understand that uh, bipin chandra uh, very nicely tells us this politics of these groups of people and that politics of these groups of people is revolving around single identity and that identity is that of religion the identity of the rising people is a holistic related to our lives it relates to our bread butter shelter employment health and dignity while these people believe that people belonging to one religion have sim similar interest people belonging this is bipin chandra's classic definition people belonging to one religion have similar interest people belonging to two religions have diverse interest and in the final stage they say the people belonging to two religions have hostile interest now basically the interest of the people are determined by their social location social location as a beggar as a uh, labor as a professor or as a interest as a as a industrialist beggar worker professor or industrialist these are the way social stratification is there the interest of a hindu labor and a muslim labor are the same hindu professor and a muslim professor are the same but here they convert it into a vertical thing where hindus versus muslims versus christians brings in and this brings in the values of autocracy over a period of time fortunately fortunately muslim communalism became much deflated after independence and hindu communalism went from strength to strength and the worst thing which happened was that based on distorted version of history now i must here clarify one thing i already pointed out the interest of a hindu king interest of a muslim king are similar what are they to expand their empire to extract the their taxation from the poor peasants and to rule in a manner and they had alliances also a muslim king has hindu advisers hindu king has muslim uh, generals and all that there's a long thing i will not go into that but 
communal politics in india its foundation has been made by spreading misconceptions relating to history that has become the part of social common sense that's why issue like babri mosque gave such a big victory in the due course to these communal forces issue like kashi issue like mathra it is ruling the streets then issue like kau and love jihad and other things they are reigning mainly because there is a dogged consistent continuous work of spreading misconceptions now believe me you misconceptions are the ground on which hatred can be constructed i personally believe morality of religions tells us to love the humanity it may be hinduism it may be islam it may be christianity love is a central message of most of the religion and spreading hatred is the central credo of politics in the name of religion so some organization work doggedly for 95 years and through this propaganda they start kept propagating propagating and then they also gave rise to so many committed organization which are difficult to count today but their central point is the number one their central agenda which is damaging india's democracy today number one is to project the past as a glorious past now what is the past of india now they claim uh the caste system varna system was a great brilliant division of labor which gave stability to society in addition there is a claim that uh, all knowledge is already there with us it may be uh, flying pushpa viman or interplanetary travels or theory of gravity or etc etc all, all knowledge was there so past is glorious why why past is shown as glorious because manusmriti gives the values of caste and gender inequality that's why they want to project the past and then on the other hand they try to project muslims and christians as the second class citizens worse being marginalized over a period of time so of course in final thing i will say that today democracy is facing danger mainly because of politics which is coming under the cover of religion here again i will like to give two more examples i'll give just give me two minutes one is that if i want to show the contrast between values of the rising classes values of the declining classes i will pick up bhimrao baba saab ambedkar from the rising classes bhimrao baba saab ambedkar he on one hand went on for social movements aimed at social equality aimed at dignity for the downtrodden and he in the process goes on to burn manusmriti as embodiment of values of the feudal times values of the past which keep women and dalits at subordinate level same ambedkar who burns manusmriti goes on to become the chairman of drafting committee of india's constitution which gives us liberty equality fraternity on the other side there is a representative from declining organizations in the name of k sudarshan who was once the chief of rss in year 2000 he said indian constitution is based on the western values throw it away and bring a constitution based on indian holy books and obviously the indication is towards those books which are talking about which are talking about uh birth based birth based inequality so this is to me today's india's today india's democracy is in danger mainly because of emotive issues built around religion and finally of course one can go on and criticize the communal forces the organization which has brought in this such a massive decline of democracy but what is important is how do we change it the test of our commitment to society lies in changing it 
so this will be my last point and uh, my feeling is that today we have come to a very dangerous turn in the in our uh, republic where democracy is really on the verge really being stifled and it is really being attacked in a very severe manner what can be done one is of course we do launch massive campaigns which highlight the values of people like gandhi people like molana abul kalam azad take inspiration from bhagat singh and take the values of ambedkar as our defining credo at the same time friends we can't save our democracy unless unless the hatred which has been drilled into people's mind the hatred is done away through our consistent work at the grassroots i personally have come to believe that unless we connect to the society take up their issues and unless we communicate the values of india's pluralism diversity the central things which gandhi underlined which jawaharlal nehru underlined in his book discovery of india made into a very brilliant serial by sham benegal bharat ek khoj sorry so many of these things are in hindi but still these are the things which need to be communicated apart from that many of our friends have contributed brilliantly in the form of videos films and other material which needs to be taken to the people once romila thopper the great historian of india said that of course here i am putting forward my point everybody cannot equal romila thopper or irfan habib scholarship and be uh, search for the truth but fortunately we have these great scholars who have contributed to the truth what we need is the bridges which take this truth to the community in a creative form through cultural mechanisms through bringing up institutions community centers peace centers which not only relate to the social movements for equality but which also fight against the hatred which has become so deep rooted in our indian community and i am convinced unless we fight against hatred democracy cannot be sustained because hatred is a fertile ground for marginalizing certain sections of society and if certain sections of society are marginalized democracy cannot flourish democracy cannot progress so we need to have a multi layered struggle right from community where we try to communicate these uh, these correct things coming from nehru and gandhi and romila thopper and irfan abi to the campaigns for campaigns against unemployment campaigns for farmers rights campaigns for small traders campaign campaigns for workers campaign for women security and all those things if we do that i think we do stand some chance for saving democracy i want to be optimist i want to be optimist despite the dark times which we are facing and in those times my main focus is what do we do what do i do i cannot say this should happen there question is what i do matters and this applies to all of us with due apologies unless we all commit for a better society democracy in india cannot be deeper thank you very much thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to express my opinion i am grateful thank you ram for delivering this uh, very very erudite lecture we have uh, we have highlighted the roots of democracy in india lies in values of our freedom movement that is a basic message freedom movement also meant fighting feudal values fighting caste hierarchies gender hierarchies nurturing the value of diversity uh, your call the final call is you are giving you are asking requesting all of us 
to keep this struggle for democracy alive. It is not a lost cause, but it depends on all of us to carry on this struggle of democracy. You uh, pointed out that we need democratic culture for democracy. For political democracy, we need a democratic culture of equality, of freedoms, of association, of dignity, of uh, individual feeling of uh, individual rights. Uh, you also said that how uh, not only Muslims are suffering, but all are suffering, one by one. Everybody is coming within this, uh, within the web of uh, being attacked and being marginalized. I remember one, uh, a couple by Rahat Indori, which is in Hindi and I'll translate in English also. Lagegi aag to aayenge sabhi zab mein. Yaha par sirf hamara makan thodi hai. If there is fire, then uh, it will consume everybody. In this area, my house is not the only house. So all houses will burn. Uh, we have to be aware and uh, with your wonderful call that we all work to promote the values of democracy, learning from our heroes of freedom movement, learning from their values, and taking up common issues, the real issues of people, of livelihood, of unemployment, of, uh, of, of various uh, issues that really matter to people. So thank you uh, for your very erudite lecture. And with this, uh, I open up uh, for discussion. Are there any, uh, there are no questions. You can put in the chat box or if somebody wants to, open the mic and uh, speak, then I would welcome that. Uh, but uh, please be very brief. Sometimes in name of question, we start uh, an alternative discourse. Uh, please do not do that. Uh, I think Professor Hargobal is uh, making some comments. Uh, he can come and speak, say a few words. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Please, please uh, Professor Hargobal. Uh, please unmute yourself, Professor Hargopal. Professor Hargopal is a very, very celebrated uh, activist and defender of democratic rights, a professor uh, himself. Are you there, Professor? Uh, by the time, uh, uh, Manish, you can uh, go ahead. Please be very brief. One minute or uh, maximum one and a half minute. Good evening, sir. Th th thank you for your insightful uh, lecture. And uh, you have uh, highlighted the current uh, state of affair in the India. My question is that if a government represent the figure of his country, Whatever government we are having today at the center, it has been elected through the democratic process and it, it is representative of the nation. So can we not say that the present government is what the Indian society want? It fulfills the inspiration, aspiration of the Indian society at large. Yeah, I think your question is a, a excellent question. I must admire your question. Now, uh, that brings us to the question of whether democracy is always a representative of the aspirations of the people. Now, unfortunately, if what you have been witnessing in Maharashtra in last couple of weeks, sometimes a democratic process is undermined by money power, muscle power, propaganda, and other things. Now, I can ask you a counter question. I am not asking you. I'm asking myself a counter question. Did Hitler represent the aspirations of the people? And so question is many times the democratic process itself can be manipulated through various mechanisms. And one of the worst mechanism which is employed by people 
is to use religion religions emotive things when they come in when elections are won on the names of religions identity <clears throat> i hold that it is a subversion of, of democratic process right from the beginning so if some party electoral party unfortunately have to identity of religion as its central point that is cutting the roots of democratic process right in the beginning so i will now i will feel the present government falls in that category whatever interpretations you make how do we stop in the democratic system i don't know but many people can come to the power can come to power by using democracy and then cut the roots of democracy for their narrow goals which are totally against the values of democracy professor hargopal is saying that uh, he has a problem with his mic uh, and so he is unable to ask his question professor uh, professor you could perhaps type your question if you uh, or your comments uh, not necessarily question uh, i'll read some of the questions so that uh, ram you can take them collectively one by one I, my memory is poor one by one all right so uh, dr uh, mahmood uh, appreciates your insightful lecture uh, muhammad uh, thank you yeah. thank you uh, dr sayed uh, dr sayed says how can we secularize and democratize the fourth pillar he means media perhaps uh, the fourth pillar which seems to be the fifth column nowadays yeah see uh, i think uh, this is a very important question and uh, if you notice right from 2004 i hope you can make the correlation strong uh, many media houses were bought over by the by corporate sector close to the ruling government close to the communal politics and by now most of this so called formal media is being controlled by uh, those corporate houses which are giving aeroplanes and helicopters to the ruling party now there is a need i think to create a our own media i know it is a tall order i am not asking for big television sets or big uh, uh, big newspaper uh, print media which i don't think we can handle but we ourselves can dedicate to spread the truth through some of the mechanisms we keep blaming, blaming whatsapp university but who has stop us from using whatsapp for the correct uh, correct things who has asked us to stop using youtube or facebook or whatever things we can i think we need to train our younger generation in the values and in these sort of uh, these sort of uh, media which has a big reach question is i'll blame myself i'll blame ourselves that we are not using this new new easily available uh the media sections and create a fourth pillar ourselves we can do it if if we commit ourselves i'm sure because even today i believe that people believing in diversity pluralism are large in number question is we have to make a link we have to make a platform for these people and as i said that we have to act as bridges from the uh, icons of freedom movement to the scholars of freedom movement to the community and that can be done with the help of a social media and and question is we we can blame others for misusing social media but question is what are we doing to use a social media in a correct and the positive way which is possible to do and which we must do if we want to maintain the fourth pillar fourth pillar we have to create a fourth fourth pillar from our efforts Uh, the, one more thing i if i may add uh, very briefly i please, think please, media please. is crossing the lakshman rekha and violating law in spreading hatred so that is when us we the active citizens should come and become citizens use the rights given by the constitution and democracy exercise them file complaints let us do hard work to make the media also accountable if they are spreading fake news crossing the lakshman rekha and spreading hatred 
Cynthia Ghorke has asked a question. Uh, thanks, Punani ji, for your briefing information of democracy. Hatred is being expanded through mass media. How and who is responsible for the same? Uh, I think you already answered, but still, if you want to... No, yeah. I don't want to add anything. Because there is yeah. no point in naming a particular uh, Sintia also agreeing. Agreeing. again and again. It will be a repetition. We can Sintia just. Sintia is also agreeing uh, and she is satisfied. Thank you. Uh, Ahmed Ali Momin has asked Can we say that Indian democracy is kind of majoritarian democracy? Yeah, as I said, it is an elected autocracy and it is a majoritarian. To call it democracy will be, I think, a sort of a being too liberal, being too liberal in assessing it. It is already the democracy is being undermined uh, in a very, very strong way. And majoritarianism, majoritarianism is the dominant trend in the current society. Yes, actually, uh, democracy is rule of majority, but that majority gets constituted and reconstituted uh, on policies. You know, different people, different policies, and you'll find majorities shifting and getting reconstituted. But majoritarianism uh, is an ideology or is a <clears throat> doctrine which says a majority community, it constructs a permanent majority on basis of religion, ethnicity, race, language, or, or any identity. And that is what is a big problem. Indian democracy is becoming a majoritarian, uh, at least temporarily. It is taking steps towards majoritarianism. I won't say it has become uh, the, uh, 10 years is too less a time in, uh, uh, in the age of a nation, in the age of a country. This is passing. We have seen emergency and hopefully if we heed to Dr. Punyani's uh, call and become active citizens, we'll uh, uh, bury authoritarianism that has crept, it, uh, uh, crept into our body politics uh, temporarily. Any more questions? I don't see any other question. Uh, there is still uh, five, ten minutes if somebody wants to. Yes, uh, uh, Ravi Raman. Yeah, sir, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's an excellent uh, uh, speech. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Punyani. I mean, it's so enlightening. Uh, you, you have made a point that, look, um, the polarization is taking place along the lines of religion. Yes, that's true. Uh, along with that, obviously, one would expect that uh, uh, some sort of uh, blurring of religion and caste would also be taking place. And if you find uh, the 2014 and 2019 elections and also the recent 2021 state elections, one would find that uh, the, the ruling government has been in a position to get an extensive support from Delis and OBCs. So obviously, as you have rightly pointed out, that this polarization uh, which is taking place is along the lines of religion. And in that process, uh, this blurring of religion and caste uh, would also be taking place. So my, my, my doubt or my uh, curiosity is something connected with the future potentiality of this sort of a uh, this sort of a, uh, what should I say, recomposition of the BJP or the ruling government. Yeah. My, uh, I, I would prefer to ask whether this would put a break in the classical Brahmanism uh, or in terms of Hindutva processes, or would it just lead to a different kind of massification of Hindutva process? Thank you so much. Yeah, I think, again, this is a very brilliant question. Uh, first, right in the beginning, I must say, uh, this is this will be strengthening Brahmanism in a deeper way. Second is your point is correct that many of the Dalit, OBC and uh, uh, Adivasis, uh, they have been uh, voting for this communal party. The thing is that uh, this uh, communal party not only has muscle, muscle power and money power, it has also a huge amount of man power, man or a woman power. Uh, whatever you say, sorry to be gender uh, uh, discriminatory, I don't want to be. This power, uh, human power, it has a, a great its command. It has floated various organizations to work amongst uh, Adivasis, like Vanavasi Kalyanashram, 
to work amongst dalits it has samajik samrasta manch and in these it is employing social engineering social engineering uh, is one way where they try to win over these communities so professor ganesham shah made a very brilliant observation saying that they want to present a hindu unity keeping the inequalities intact so those inequalities of caste gender and uh, adivasi inequalities they want to maintain by using uh, this uh, social engineering the, then they are trying to co-opt many of the icons from these communities and these icons are co-opted by them without taking the values of them now classic example is that of ambedkar now this ambedkar anniversary is being celebrated by many of these communal organizations with big pomp and show bigger uh, bigger uh, at bigger scale than what adiv uh, that uh, what dalits will do but as far as the values of ambedkar are concerned they are buried deep into the heap of their ideological productions in which they are saying that we had different castes we had different genders but, uh, different castes in particular and they are we are all living in harmony and peace and uh, uh, what not uh, in the ancient times so this is something some area in which they have worked a lot there are icons like suhel dev who have been picked up from pasi community and they have been projected not only as the icon of uh, hindus but giving them a anti muslim color so this uh, because of their huge proliferation of organizations like varnavasi kalyan ashram samajik samrastha manch and all that they have been able to achieve this and uh, but my understanding is that brahminization is very deeply ingrained in all these processes and what by i mean by brahminization is uh, undermining undermining of the dalits and adivasis and giving women a secondary place through their through their ideology uh, thank you ram uh, the next question now so thanks a lot can i can i get Can I ask? Just a minute. Just a minute. There are many questions in the chat box. I'm taking those first. Mustafa has raised his hand, uh, and after Mustafa, uh, I'll uh, yeah, yeah. Just just hold on. So uh, I'll read out the questions in the chat box. In my opinion, the citizens or organizations. Atul Apte has asked uh, this question. Uh, in my opinion, the citizens or organizations believe in democratic value are spread across India. and are not in sync this is a big hindrance in having a mass movement to make people aware how do you think this can be done yeah i think this uh, question is uh, uh, atul apte i fully agree with you there is a need for a social platform which try can work on the common minimum program of democracy pluralism and diversity and try to connect up try to connect up with the scattered organizations which at core are very democratic but they i think they are disunited so one of the challenges which the people like us face is how to create a platform where such organizations can be linked uh keeping in mind their agenda and uh, taking the common minimum program and leaving the differences intact i mean we need not work on the minor uh, petty differences but focus on the broad understanding of indian constitution and uh, secularism so what uh, mr apte i agree with you that there is a urgent need for such a national platform which tries to rope up rope in uh, these organizations keeping giving them their full dignity respecting their differences and working on the commonalities of our understanding if we do that i think that will be a great step in strengthening our cause next one irfan uh, thank you ram uh, is india heading towards uh, uh, towards being a failed nation shashi asks <laughs> uh, i think i'll skip this question a uh, failed nation or what i don't know but uh, all those countries which take the path of communalism politics in the in the driving seat their fate is that like pakistan 
or Bangladesh, not Bangladesh, Bangladesh is somehow doing very well uh, like that, or Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a classic example when uh, Sinhala Buddhism was kept in the driving seat and Hindu, Hindu Tamils were marginalized the path which they took. It is there in front of us. To call them as failed state uh, is uh, maybe more, uh, I mean, uh, one will have to define that. But basically, these states cannot make any progress. They are authoritarian. They are some corporates rule the roost. And other people are dumped into the abyss of poverty, ignorance, and uh, deprivation. Yeah. Next one. Uh, Mohinudin, uh, Mohinudin Kutti asks, the ruling party claimed that it will continue in power for at least 40 years. <laughs> Your comment, please. My comment is that if we don't follow the path of what Mr. Apte is telling us to do, or what I requested that we work at the grassroots, raising community centers, trying to associate with social movement, if we don't do that effectively, the ruling party may be right, unfortunately. Uh, Dr. Saeed has one more question. I'll take a little later. Uh, Sir Mahmood also would like to ask question. I'll open up for you uh, later. Uh, Professor Hargopal has uh, written, the uh, democracy is in crisis all over the world. The techno managerial class is devoid of any commitment to higher human values, not even modern outlook. So I think this is an observation. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Professor Hargopal, I fully uh, I thank you for your kind words, and I fully appreciate what you're saying. This is a global phenomenon also. After the decline of uh, Soviet state, Soviet Union, which was trying to give some sort of anchoring to the uh, rising uh, democratic spirit in a different way. I'm, I don't mean exactly that. But this uh, that process has been replaced by uh, promoting religion, picking up civilization's elite aspects and presenting the state as civilization state. That tendency is going on in many other countries also. And uh, this global phenomenon has also worsened the situation in India as well. Yeah. Next three questions, and then we close the question and answer session. So please be brief. Uh, Mustafa, first. Mustafa, are you there? Please open up we, and please be very brief. Mustafa. Yeah, yeah. can you hear me, sir? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Mustafa. Thank, uh, thank you, sir, for your informative lecture. I just, my question is what uh, does it mean when government changed the city name? Is it, is it in right direction? What message they want to con convey to the society? That is my See, question. I will just tell you, changing the names of city now, Hyderabad is next in line. Yes. But I'll tell you a very interesting episode, an interesting anecdote. One journalist went to Professor Irfan Habib and asked him why the names of the cities are being changed. Professor Habib said that uh, India is a mixed culture, diverse culture. And the Islamic component, which is there in Indian culture, that is being undone. That is being undone by changing the names of the cities. And then he takes a, uh, he uh, says back that if they are so much interested in taking away the Islamic component and the Persian component from Indian culture, they should start changing the surnames of the people, beginning with changing the surname of Mr. Amit Shah. And Shah word is a Persian word. So probably that's what they should do. Anyway, this is a tragic part of our uh, history. And uh, India is a mixed culture. Trying to take away any of these things will deprive India of its richness, which is uh, remains in its diversity and pluralism. Yeah. yeah. Matthew, uh, Matthew, Matthew Kurian, yes, uh, please go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I thank uh, Professor Ram for the very insightful talk. Mm -hmm. I have a very simple, simple question. Uh, I'm, a politi I'm a student of political economy. From that perspective, I have a question. Uh, we are part of the modern capitalist world system. Uh, so my query is, what about the global perception of 
the the change of the changes which we are experiencing in india so the global perception on indian yeah. democracy as well as indian political economy yeah globally also you know globally also there are large sections like uh, various human rights related groups amnesty yeah. international and uh, it various us bodies and there is a body called this uh, genocide watch all of them are giving us adequate warnings that we are heading towards a sort of a genocidal situation there are various uh, global organizations like even now that nupur sharma case there was not so much of a protest till the gulf countries protested against that so global things are there but obviously our problems cannot be solved by global bodies and other countries our problems here we have to solve ourselves unless we do it outside forces cannot but mike sir my query is you know global capital is very happy with the power structure of india to me yeah see so, here there is a dichotomy between global capital and the global human rights organizations organizations devoted to human rights are not very happy with what is happening in india and even those uh, people who are for these values they are protesting against what is happening in india in various ways global capital has its own logic which is very different from the logic of the uh, human rights uh, understanding of the world yeah i'll read the question last question uh, of course i'm going to invite uh, hasan mahmood sir but before i invite him i read the last question and uh, open up uh, for uh, hasan mahmood sir this is the last question and uh, uh, please answer both together you will be able to answer uh, there is uh, the, uh, ha there is di distress seeping into psyche of common public can democracy really function in such an environment of distress uh, uh, hasan mahmood sir please open up your mic and ask your question assalamu alaikum thank you for arranging this uh, event and uh, salute to dr puniyani i am his follower since decades the communal violence in india has many dimensions and one dimension is often ignored or overlooked that is the communal violence in india inspires communal violence in pakistan and in bangladesh my yes, country yes. i am a bangladeshi canadian and then something happens in india communal it ignites our violent maulanas they yeah. ignite their followers commit some violence against hindus in bangladesh and that in turn empowers communal pundits in india example when babri mm. masjid was damaged in 1992 mm. hindus were attacked in our country in bangladesh right. Right. temples were broken so it is not actually a, a local indian issue it is a subcontinental issue what is your take what is your take on it sir i will actually fully agree with you my take is that uh, communalism in one country will uh, promote communalism in another country and india being a major country here the reaction to communalism in india in bangladesh and pakistan is but natural but natural means not right not right but yes. this is what happens and that is a unfortunate fact uh, so i don't know how to prevent it but uh, somehow i have a great respect for bangladesh the way it is its gdp is going up the way its gdp is going up the way yes. there are various people who are defending human rights in a much better way than other south asian regions so i do respect bangladesh from a distance i don't may not be knowing all the facts but somewhere uh, but communalism is such that communalism here will promote communalism there and india being the major country it is definitely likely to happen and the earlier question which uh, chair person asked about uh, whether in the people in india are feeling despondent about uh, the state of things that is very true very true a large section of minorities and large section of people believing in pluralism and democracy are feeling a bit put off bit sad and bit depressed also by the developments which are going on in india and people like us do meet many such people and we have to keep up our morale 
uh, with great superhuman efforts to keep being optimistic despite whatever we are witnessing and uh, you are absolutely right and thanks for following me and uh, thanks for your kind words for my book thank you very much uh, thank you professor ram i'll give a very brief 2 3 minutes uh, comments final comments and then invite uh, neha dabhade uh, for word of thanks the final comments are india is one country in south asia where democracy has lasted for 70 long years there were hiccups we had emergency we have problems now uh, some problems now but we are meeting this challenge it is this democracy that helped india which is so diverse otherwise to remain united uh imposing identity and linguistic and ethnic identity uh you know fragmented pakistan east pakistan and uh, uh west pakistan into two different countries so india in spite of various diversities has remained united this is an important lesson that our rulers today should learn we are going from civic nationalism to ethnic ethno nationalism based on religion where one community is trying to have a hegemonic control over another the poor in the uh, majoritarian community can be made to feel as if uh, made to feel proud about their religion as if uh, the rulers are catering to them but actually they are undermining their interests this is one thing that we have to all learn uh, this is being done through over through use of state power and overly sensitizing citizens on issues of religion you know now uh, i remember a time when uh, ramayana mahabharat so many spoofs were made uh, islam on the other hand Uh, or some movies in the uh, uh, in islam were intolerant but now the reverse is happening that uh, hindus or uh, uh, elite hindus are becoming not all hindus but elite hindus are becoming more and more or appearing to be actually uh, for them it's a political agenda but they are appearing to uh, becoming more and more uh, sensitive using sacred uh, and sacred uh, sacredizing every other symbol adding more and more sacred symbols and uh, making uh, 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 making it appear as if all hindus are very sensitive but they are not i think one thing that i would like to point out is that if we want this diversity to remain and india to remain united within this diversity democracy has a very important role that is one thing that uh, i would like to uh, note today evening uh, the second thing if all religions remain what they are all the communities remain what they are and there are a lot of culture lot of feudal cultural elements within all communities all religious communities we need internal religious reforms as well kabir says bura dekhan jo main gaya bura milya na koi जो तन देखो अपनो मुझसा बुरा ना कोई इफ वेन आई वेन टू फाइंड फॉल्ट इन अदर्स आई कुडेंट फाइंड एनी फॉल्ट इन एनी बडी आउटसाइड बट वेन आई पीव इन टू माई सेल्फ आई फाउंड नो वन इज एज बैड एज रॉन्ग एज आई एम सो कबीर सेस फोकस योर लाइफ फोकस योर एग्जामिनेशन इंटरनली In, uh, within each community we need to do we need to nurture that culture of reforms of being critical of uh, modernizing the communities unless we do that our democracy will be in jeopardy sometime or the other it will face this kind of hiccups and ram has told us very rightly has given us a formula that we need to be active citizens we need to become citizens 
a large section of India is not is still subject or in subject mode, but they have played brilliantly at times and fought emergency. They will become citizens once again and fight this. We need to become active citizens and mobilize people for common livelihood issues. Uh, thank you, Ram, for uh, a very brilliant lecture today. We had a very, very fruitful evening. And I uh, thank you, uh, Professor Siddhi and all others involved in uh, Wakam Malvi Memorial uh, and Research Center for requesting me to chair today's session. With this, I invite uh, Neha to propose a vote of thanks. Neha? Neha, are you there? Neha. I think, uh, uh, just a minute, I'll just check whether she's there. Yes, she's there. I'm here. Yeah, yeah, I'm your yeah, yeah, yeah. Please propose a vote of them. Yes, uh, sorry, there's poor connectivity. That's why camera yeah. is not working all, so well. All, but... all, all right. Neha is a deputy director uh, working with uh, Center for Study of Society and Secularism. Go ahead, Neha. Yeah. Firstly, uh, thank you so much, Ram. Uh, this is my pleasant duty to really propose a vote of thanks, but also a difficult one, uh, considering so much has gone into making of this uh, this lecture. But firstly, uh, to the really the so-called star of the evening, uh, Dr. Ram Punyani, I know how uh, how well he's followed on social media and the various invitations he gets. Uh, that's because of the brilliant lectures that he gives and the talks, which are so erudite. And he did exactly the same tonight, today, today evening. He not only uh, very uh, very eruditely put together a presentation which tells us about the challenges to democracy in a very nuanced fashion, but also showed us some way forward and tried to uh, show us how we can all come together through movements, uh, through supporting small grassroots level uh, initiatives. And I think uh, most of us will follow that. So Ram, thank you so much for that. And also patiently taking all the questions that uh, many of us pose. Uh, Ram, thank you. Uh, thank you to the chair who also uh, really answered so many questions questions also and also added his own uh, wisdom and his own insights to this lecture which only made it more enriching. Uh, thank you Professor Siti. Uh, thank you to the Wacom uh, Molvi Memorial Research Center and uh, to with CWS uh, lecture. And lastly, but most important, thank you so much to the participants who joined us today evening. I know it's late, but there's full enthusiasm. There is a lot of concern. There are a lot of questions, uh, deep engagement. So thank you to the uh, audience who has been so patient and wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you all. Uh, have a wonderful evening, wonderful day. Uh, thank you. And good night. Uh, for all whose day is ending. Thank, thank you, you very much, sir, for a delightful lecture, sir. Thank, thank you, you and good night. Ram. Thank you, Professor. Increasing our knowledge. Uh, Hargobal, Irfan, thank you all for a wonderful evening.